in the entire time. <laughs> like a two hour long picture. That, no, it'd be like 14 hours. Get back there and watch that. All right, uh, page 1107. So really quickly going back through, you're detecting some kind of mechanical vibration. Um, that vibration when I'm talking, it's hitting your eardrums. It's translated through those bones in your middle ear into the cochlea. And the cochlea, remember, is that snail-like shaped looking thing. Inside there, um, there are a number of um, receptor cells, and on the end of them, they have these little hairs. And then there's some fluid in there. And so when vibrations take place, the the fluid moves, and as the fluid moves, it causes the hairs to bend, and as the hairs bend, they bend so much, then that's what triggers an action potential to be sent down the vestibulo-cochlear nerve or auditory nerve to the brain, and then somewhere around here in your temporal lobe, um, that information is processed. And so for all you band people out there, remember things like pitch and tone and loudness and all that stuff, um, the ways that we detect different sounds are going to be based on how many of those, how much, how much stimulus those hairs, how much they get bent, how quickly that resets, and how quickly they're they're bent over and over again. Um, so all that's going to play into how we perceive and interpret um, the sounds that we hear. Yeah. Um, do you remember the answer to the day set yesterday? Do what? Do you remember the answer to the data set? B and C. B for number one, C for number two. We can look at those at the end if we have a chance. I'll pass them back and look, look at the math, make sure you did it correctly. Okay. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> um, and then the same thing there, the semicircular canals, flip over to 1109. Um, remember, there's one going this way, there's one going this way, and then there's another one at a diagonal. And so the whole purpose of these different angles of the semicircular canals is when you close your eyes and you're moving back and forth, you, you can detect which plane you're in. You, can, you have a sense of balance. Um, and so same thing. There's a bunch of hairs in there and some fluid, and as you move, that fluid moves, and that tells your body, well, that signal is sent to your brain, and your brain interprets that as whatever type of movement's taking place. Um, and so it's all... Signal transduction pathway. There's reception of a signal. There is um, transduction to the brain through the auditory nerve, uh, vestibular cochlear nerve. Um, and then in the brain, then we interpret that as how we balance, okay? Um, and so both those organs are inside the ear. And you'll notice on 1108 there at the bottom, this goes back to the whole action potentials. Um, how we perceive those sounds is gonna determine by like how quickly those action potentials take place. Um, the frequency, how far apart they're spaced, how intense the stimuli is, um, all those things are going to play a role into how our brains perceive that sound, okay? All right, and then the last thing on part four, chemoreceptors. So, um, let's, let's turn to 1110 real quick, though. And we'll skip down in the notes while we're talking about hearing. Did anybody go on the canoe trip last year? Any of y'all? You went, Miranda? Do you remember those two guys arguing about um, fish and whether the lateral line was like their ears? I don't know if you heard that combo while we were collecting like macro invertebrates, but the two older guys that were on the trip. And, and basically, um, so if you look at the at fish, you'll see this line that runs down the side of them. And that line that runs down the side of them is the lateral line system. Fish do not have what? Lungs. Well, they don't have lungs, except for a lungfish. What else? What do they not see? What do you not see on the outside? It's a lungfish. It's a fish. Ears. Um, it's like this fish in Africa that burrows up into um, like mud when in the drier months to keep from drying out. They have some kind of pseudo lung type tissue um, to help them breathe when they're out of the water. So, um, what do you say? Ears, yes. So, how do fish know when there's sound going through the water? I mean, like, if you're loud next to the water, does anybody go fishing in here? Y'all need to get out more. If you go fishing and you're loud next to the water, what's gonna happen? You're gonna scare the fish off. How do they hear that? They don't have ears. 
Good, lateral line system. So what is hearing? It's just detecting vibrations, right? So along the along each side of them, all the way down, it's like they've just got a fancy set of ears all the way down through there, where they're detecting vibrations. You can see the hairs and the sensory cells and as water flows over that. So think of the benefits, Mariah, this in the middle of the night, if you're a fish and it's dark out and you're swimming around, well, you, you're able to hear what's going on in the water around you. Probably the vibrations that you feel um, it's thought that they could probably tell like what type of fish, um, how big it is probably, um, all of those type of things just by the vibrations that, that are hitting them. Um, and so these sounds, they're, they're, I wouldn't say necessarily maybe sound, but it is just an interpretation of vibration. Now, if a sound goes through the water or somebody's outside of the water close to it and they're making a lot of racket, like my kids, every time I go take them fishing, like the fish are gonna hear that because they've got this whole system for detecting vibrations. Like they sent whatever's going on here is not right. I need to get out of here. So they, they do have a system that's, if nothing else, analogous to how we hear. It's detecting vibrations. Um, on, where's that weirdo? 1106. Read 50.9 for us, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Top of the page, 1106. An insect's ear on its leg, the tympatic tym Panic? membrane. Which is what? What would we call that? Eardrum. Visible in this SEM of a cricket's front leg vibrates in response to sound waves. The vibrations sim stimulate micro mechanoreceptors attached to the inside of the tympanic membrane. All right, so let's break this down. So their eardrum is on their leg, which is weird. I don't know why. Um, an SEM is just a scanning electron microscope why it's black and white. So when you use electron microscopes, they only give you a black and white image because they're shooting beams of electrons and that doesn't make for color. Um, and then vibrations, uh, where those are going to vibrate in response to sound waves. So that's how they're hearing. They stimulate mechanoreceptors. Mechanical receptors means the ones with little hair. So there, there's some type of mechanical movement going on. And then that sends an action potential for them to interpret as sound. Now, why is it on their legs, not on the side of their head? I don't know. Nobody consulted me. All right, um, chemicals. Where is your nose and other stuff? Smell. 1118. All right, on 1118, smell and taste are basically the same thing. Why? Or super duper similar. Katie? Yeah, so these are chemoreceptors. They're identifying chemicals. So when you eat something, you see those little papillae on your tongue. You look at yourself in the mirror and see those little bubbly things on there. Um, don't worry, it's not some kind of disease, I don't think. So inside each one of those, you have a series of taste buds. And there are different types of taste buds. There's taste buds for salty and sweet and sour and bitter and umami. Umami is what? Kind of like... Nope, it's meat. meat. Like a, detecting a meaty taste. That sounds delicious. Um, Shh. I'm on video. What page are we on again? Um, 1118. 1118. Can't give it the program, bro. So, when you eat something, Mason, the chemicals from that food are going to make their way into that t those taste buds, and then those chemical signals, depending on which one they react with, that's gonna create an action potential that's gonna send, then send that signal along to your brain and you're gonna interpret that as some type of chemical. So you know when there's something sweet or salty or sour or bitter or umami. Just like a while ago, I went down to the faculty workroom, I got me a bunch of red velvet cake, I ate way too much of it, I probably needed a shot of insulin, and then after I ate it, like I had, I still had like a whole bag of candy here. But in the candy, it was really like a trail mix bag. And you know what I wanted to eat after I had eaten all that red velvet cake? I wanted to eat a bunch of salty stuff. I didn't want any more sweets. 
My buddy's like, you don't need any more sweets or you're going to die. So, <laughs> you're going to go into a coma and pass out. So, anyway, um, what did I eat? I just ate salty stuff after that. It kind of bounced it out. You know what I'm talking about? You know, like when you eat candy corn, but you eat about three peanuts with it every time. Or my wife likes to, to eat a little, like, slice of salami um, with candy, uh, candy corn. Mix it together. She thinks it's the best thing ever. I should try it. You don't mix it with anything else? You don't mix it with salty? I absolutely mix it with salty. You mix it with salty, yeah. Well, I mean, like, I don't know. Maybe I was, when I was your age, I mean, I like sweets. Um, I would prefer M plain M&Ms over peanut. But now, like, I don't hardly want to eat a, a plain M&M. It's just too sweet. But I like the balance of, like, the sugar and then the peanut. And then kind of balance it up. So your body, anyway, is telling you like what you need. Um, I've heard stories of people out at sea, and I think maybe I talked about this the other day, maybe it was the other class, where like people out at sea, they're catching fish, they're stranded out there, but they're still catching fish. And instead of like wanting the meat like most people would normally want when they eat a fish, they were like focused on like their brain was like, eat the eyeballs, eat the liver, eat the, I don't know what else, sp spinal, drink the spinal fluid. Um, in order to get the nutrients and stuff they needed. So it was just a way of like, this is what this tastes like, and this is what you're going to crave or what you need in your body. So it's your your brain's way of communicating that to you. I have a question. Yeah. Where does like, um, like you know, peppers fall in your taste buds? Hot? Yeah. That's a good question. Bitter, I don't know if pepper would be bitter. Well, I mean, you can have like no. Sours like, like sour patch kids. Of, you think so? You can kind of have like a taste on top of the spiciness. Like it can kind of be like a sweeter spiciness. You should look that up for extra credit. Good thinking. Um, I don't know if he's gonna do that. Maybe one of the rest of y'all wants to. Don't be a slacker. All right. So anyway, so in the same thing in your nose. Yesterday we talked about you know when we smell toots. Basically, you're getting somebody's fecal matter that's lodging up in your nose mucus, and you're interpreting that like, oh, I smell fecal matter. Um, and those chemicals, if you notice here on 119, are just moving up in there, dissolving on a little patch of um, cells up there called the olfactory epithelia. And that as they dissolve in that mucus, those you see the cilia there, as they detect chemicals, then that triggers an action potential. That signal is sent to the brain. Your brain interprets it as whatever type of, you know, stimulus it is, whatever type of smell. And you'll notice here in your notes, the note writer says that taste is about 80% smell, what we interpret taste to be. And that proves true if you think about it when you guys get sick, your nose gets stopped up, um, you got a runny nose real bad, like you can't hardly taste food, right? And you can't taste food because most of what we perceive as taste is actually smell. Um, but really both of these are go hand in hand because they're both just different ways of detecting chemicals um, and sending that signal to our brain. What are, what are those chemicals? What are we eating? What are we tasting? All right, any questions there? Yummy, I know we got you thinking about food since it's lunchtime. Part five, let's get into something really comp, super duper complicated here. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, sight. Let's hit sight real quick. Like I said, I'm not super worried about anatomical features, um, the anatomy of the eye. I am worried about your understanding. You can look at this and you can figure out what's going on in terms of signal transduction pathway. How are these cells communicating um, and relaying this stimuli? But I'm gonna go through some basic parts here, just FYI for you guys. I know some of y'all see some glasses out there in the crowd. I'm sure some people in here are wearing contacts. Some of y'all probably have surgery one day. Um, so, how do we see? It's a good question. We're, our, our eyes are just doing what? Bending light. Bending light? Refracting it? What? 
Maybe y'all know something I don't. No, I, we're just detecting colors, right? Yeah. I mean, that's all we're doing. Like our, our eyes are just detecting colors and then we interpret what those colors and... It's like, have you ever seen like a super pixelated image on like a computer or an old computer where you can see like the different pixels and stuff? Basically, that our brain or our, our eyes have a number of different little pixel detecting cells that can detect like there's a color. Black, 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 brown, 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 white, 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 red, 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 red. And it's showing us that. And so then our brain has to then interpret what that is. Yesterday we talked about how, you know, people interpret or think they've seen black panthers running around. Their brain is just seeing different colors or shadows or shapes and their their brain then has to interpret what they think that is. Um, I swear the other day I was walking down the hallway and at the end of the hall somebody came around the corner and I thought it was Miss Keziah, Abigail's mother. And then I got closer and I realized it was like some middle schooler because apparently I'm half blind. Um, I think they did look similar from a distance. But anyway, um, so our brains, you know, we see stuff and we're trying to figure out what that stuff is, um, especially if it's far off. I like to hunt a lot. And so like my brain, my eyes are just constantly like looking for stuff in the woods and you're constantly like, is especially when it's really dark out and the light's really low, you're, you're like, is, is that a deer? Is that a squirrel? What is that over there moving? So um, our brains are constantly looking for stuff, looking for patterns, looking for um, different objects for either food, safety, variety of, t variety of things. All right, so how does this work? So uh, light comes in through the cornea. Um, and so the shape of your eye, the shape of the cornea is gonna affect how you see. Y'all probably heard of people having LASIK. My wife had that not too long ago where they go in and they laser basically and cut up your cornea and then it heals back a certain way. And basically it's changing the shape of that where it affects how you see. Light comes through, there's some fluid in the front called the aqueous humor, it's basically like water. And then there are a bunch of muscles around your lens. So there's a lens in there, it's just like an itty bitty little marble, probably in our eyes it would be about the size of, a, of like a BB. And the muscles around that will either contract or dilate depending on how we focus. So like if I'm looking at my paper and then I look back there in the back, like my eyes, it's the lens is having to change shape. Just like if you're looking through, you know, binoculars at something up close and then you're looking at a distance, you've got to turn the lens to get it focused, okay? Um, and then when you get old, what happens to that lens, Mason? You should know this, don't dishonor your family. Anyone? Your eyes get old. old, your lens gets old, cataracts, gets cloudy, and then you have to have it replaced. Uh, you got cataracts? Yeah, I took medicine and I like, I don't know about that. That sounds interesting. Um, okay, so um, as you get older, like me, it also gets harder that, that lens gets harder and not as durable and your muscles in your eye get old and decrepit and it's harder to focus on different objects or focus from one thing to another quickly. So anyway, light comes through there. It's focused on the back of your eye. And so in the back of your eye, all around there, you've got the retina. The retina, if you'll notice there in the second part, that's where all of your light sensing cells are. So there's a bunch of light sensing cells, rods and cones, and then if light comes through, it detects the stimulus, then it sends that signal along the neurons into the optic nerve, down uh, back to the brain, and it splits toward the back of your head here and the back of your brain. Um, that's where your vision is processed. A good whack to the back of the head, well, I mean, might kill you, but um, it, it could also affect your eyesight because that's where most of that processing takes place in the occipital cortex, the back of your head. Um, and then outside that, there's the choroid, which just provides nourishment. Remember, it takes a lot of energy to send all those signals. And the sclera is the white part of your eye. Remember, don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. That only applies in revolutionary times, not, not nowadays. Um, and then you've got the optic nerve that exits the back. And if you'll flip over real quick, 1115. 
you can see as light comes in our field of view, how those optic nerves, they cross over, they make like an X cross over and they go to different parts of the back uh, part of your brain there, um, where then processing would take place. The response would, would whatever, to whatever you're looking at. Now in the notes, two types of receptor, receptor cells for your eyes. Rods, what do they do, Mariah? These photoreceptor cells are between black, white, and shades of gray. They are the most abundant in all animals having these structures. They possess rhodopsin pigment. It is a combination of retinal vitamin A and opsin proteins. A shape change allows for depolarization to occur in the so if there is light that comes in and they sense that, then depolarization takes place. And then that signal is transmitted through the optic nerve to the back of the brain where processing can take place and a response could take place. Um, how many different shades do you, these rod, do you see with these rods? I wanna say it's closer to 50, but I'm not sure. <laughs> okay i don't know that. um rods are really important if you are a what i'm, I'm requiring you to think on this one and answer anyone anyone why would that be important to them why do they not see in color? I guess that's one way they see. I figured. Well, dogs can see some color. Can't yeah, it's a little this, bit though. But this like, might be a bit of a stretch, but like things that live in the poles, because everything there is like. Is yeah, I don't know about that, but maybe that's true. Where there's not a lot of colors. Mm -hmm. and uh, oceans, so you can see shadows, like spectrum. Yeah, I was just really going for animals that are out at night a lot. Um, predators, prey, things that are out at night, they're going to need lots of rods because you're going to have to see in the dark. If you ever tried to wander around in the woods in the middle of the night, you get slapped in the face a few times with some limbs, you probably stop wandering around. <laughs> so we don't have very good night vision. We have a lot of our processing and, and cells are dedicated to color vision um, because that's more important for us. And we figured out how to make fire. I am man. I and so, um, but if you're an animal and you're hunting in the night or you're trying to get away from stuff that's hunting you in the night, you, you better hope you have some really good night vision. Um, otherwise, you've got some serious problems. So rods help with that night vision. Um, that's what helps you see at night. That's why, you know, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you stumble to the bathroom or whatever, um, no matter what color your, your walls are painted, almost everything appears what? gray or blackish or dark color, right? Even if you got a little bit of light coming through the window, um, everything is very, there's no color really, it, it, assuming you don't have any lights on. So it's because really your rods are the only thing picking up any, any um, light at that moment. All right, cones, cones are easy. Cones mean color, good. Cones, color, the C's. Yeah, y'all can remember it that way. Um, we have a wide variety of uh, colors that we can pick up because of the red, blue, and green um, cones that we have. There's different ones. We're gonna talk more about color blindness when we get to genetics. Color blindness is a sex-linked disease where um, it's primarily limited to men. Um, guys like one in 10, I think, have some type of color blindness, which means you wouldn't make one of those types of rods or the pigment for one of those types of rods. Um, excuse me, cones. Um, it's very, very rare to have like no cones where you would where you would see in like like grayscale, but it isn't super rare. Like I said, about one in ten, one in fifteen, um, where someone is missing like shades of a color. One of my nephews that come over, comes over, he goes to university, he's missing a, a cone, um, and I think like purples and red, uh, greens and st stuff like that, they appear more like just a brownish color to him. So, um, and then girls, it would be super duper rare. I've only met one person 
one woman that was that had any type of color blindness. And the funny thing is, she worked in a clothing store. <laughs> Probably a bad idea. Anyway, um, so cones are important for color vision. Now, in your notes, there is something I wanted to read. Um, yeah, because women have two X's and you only have one and the gene for making those cones are on the X. So if you get a bad one, you're screwed. If a girl gets a bad one, she's still got a good one that can make up for it. Does that make sense? Do those like colorblind glasses actually work? Like yeah, I think they do somewhat. I think my nephew has some. Maybe I'll get him to, maybe he'll let us borrow him one day. No, Where? Aiden is uh, colorblind. Who? Aiden Higgins. He's in- uh, Let's not name anybody in particular on the internet here. Oh, <laughs> uh, hi internet, sorry. Shh, maybe they'll forget. <laughs> um, there's something I wanted, oh, here we go, sorry. On 11, 11, let's flip over there. Photo receptors. We forgot to talk about. So, the most primitive type of eyes are in planaria. These are flatworms. They're basically just a few basic light sensing cells to detect where light is. Um, I mean, plants don't have a nervous system, but they do have a way, they have pigments to detect where light is. So, a similar thing, but definitely not a nervous system where processing takes place, but a way to respond in the environment. On 11.11 on the right side there, you see an insect. We're all familiar with flies. They actually have, each one of these is almost like its own little eye because each one of those things has its own lens. So we only have one lens per eye. They have a one lens on each one of these. Um, what do they call this thing? Uh, who knows? There's a bunch. There's, there's called compound eyes because you've got so many thousand light detectors um, and each one has its own light focusing lens. Um, important adaptation for flying insects and small animals constantly threatened with predation. Um, basically it offers it a very wide field of view and it can detect movement very easily. That's why it's so difficult to kill a fly even if you've got, you know, fly swatter and you're whacking it at 100 miles an hour. And sometimes those flies get away because those eyes. These eyes are crying. These eyes have seen a lot of... And also, insects can, um, read that last paragraph on 11.11 for us. Ashlyn? Insects have excellent color vision and some, including bees, can see ultraviolet range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Because the UI is invisible to humans, we miss any differences in the environment that bees and other insects detect. Ooh, they get to see UV light. We do not get to see that spectrum of light. Otherwise, when you go to the tanning bed, Katie, you know, I mean, who knows what things would look like. So you can't see UVA, UVB, UVC. Um, I've heard it explained that um, insects can see this ultraviolet range when it's like reflecting off a flower or something, like it's almost like a beacon, like glowing. I don't know if that's actually the case. Um, I haven't put on my bee glasses lately. But um, I mean, that would make sense if you're an animal and you're a pollinator, um, it would make it, visible and easy to find different flowers and stuff that you're looking for. So that would be pretty cool. Maybe we'll get some of those one day. All right, next thing, locomotion. You guys need to know different types of locomotion and that's gonna lead into our last and most difficult part here, muscle contraction. Locomotion means movement. Process consists second largest consumer of energy between in an organism. Um, because of the amount of gravity and friction that you have to overcome with movement. So this is kind of an evolutionary discussion, um, how organisms move. If you are an organism that primarily lives in the water, what do you have to overcome, Tay? Uh, that's the current. No, just read it for us. Um, no, just Where? Underwater. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you live in the water, think uh, sharks, dolphins, penguins. These all have a torpedo-shaped body, slender, long, 
in order to move through the water at a very efficient pace, okay? Um, there's very little gravity that you have to deal with in water because of buoyancy, um, but the issue you have is friction. Remember, water is a whole lot thicker than air, and so that's what you gotta move through. Um, you know, if you ever tried running through water, the beach or something, it's, it's a difficult task. So that's one thing that you have to overcome, and, and that's a way around it, that fusiform body. If you are a land organism, what do you have to do, Miranda? Keep going. Okay. Organisms have strong muscular limbs to overcome gravity. Yes, strong muscular limbs. So gravity is holding us down. There's very little in the way of friction um, because of there's air resistance doesn't really, unless you've got like a wind blowing in your face. Um, so mostly what we're trying to overcome in movement is gravity. Now, this really depends on what type of organism you are. If you think about like most fish, um, swimming through the water, they're swimming through the water as fast as we can run wide open on land or faster. Um, like the fastest fish would be like almost like the fastest land animals. So like, you know, a deer or a lion or something like that that can run at 30 or 40 miles an hour. Well, there's plenty of sharks like makos that can go, I think, 50 miles an hour speed over short distances um, just because their body is so adapted and they're so well versed um, at moving through the water. And then air, organisms are flying or gliding. Tell us about them, Katie. Much gravity to overcome and much friction to overcome because of air resistance. These require massive amounts of energy to move through the water. Gravity requires that energy to move through the water. Air resistance. Now, okay, so we've got a little bit of a contradiction, so let's talk about that. This says air, you still have gravity to overcome, obviously, because it took us, you know, till 100 years ago to figure out how to fly, but, um, it, uh, it, it says that there's a lot of friction because of air, and the previous one said there's a little friction because of air. Why do you think air organisms have more friction in the air? Because they're out in the wide open space and there's nothing to like really obstruct wind. Like yeah, so you, typically the higher up you go, the more wind you have to deal with. Um, and so you've probably seen like currents and leaves and even maybe normal, normal hardly any wind on the ground you may see up in the trees, it looks like the wind's blowing. So there's typically more air resistance, and then also you have to overcome that, that amount of gravity. It requires massive amounts of energy. you will probably seen like hummingbirds, how much energy they have to consume to keep those wings beating all the time. Birds also have a very high um, body temperature that they maintain for warmth. So an eagle, just th but just think about it in terms of their adaptations, the very thin bones, the honeycomb-like structure in the bones. Some people say hollow. I mean, um, it's it's super thin. There's not much in there. Um, it's definitely, their bones aren't as thick as ours. And then, if you have an eagle, I don't know if you've ever seen a bald eagle. We've got quite a few around here now. Um, a bald eagle may have a wingspan of six, seven feet, which is pretty wide, but it may only weigh 15 pounds. So you've got a very small mass for the amount of space that it's taking up the way it looks, just because feathers don't weigh a lot um, and the bones don't weigh a lot um, because they have to overcome those forces of gravity and the friction from um, resistance from air. All right, so how do we overcome all these things? With our muscles. Let's turn over to 1120. So think about your biceps. Inside the biceps, you've got a, bus, a, bustle, a, a bundle of muscle fibers. Inside each one of those, you have a single muscle fiber, which would be like a muscle cell. Muscle cells are typically multinucleate. That's why you see a bunch of nuclei in there. And then inside those muscle cells, you have a, a bunch of different myofibrils or muscle sections. Okay, and these are gonna vary in size depending on like how much you work out, how much your resistance you put on there because you're either gonna add protein to that and make them bigger or you could deplete them like in a starvation situation. Now, there's three types of muscle, skeletal, um, heart, car or cardiac, and then what's the other one? Smooth muscle. Smooth muscles are all the muscles in your body that are? Controlling organs. 
round, good. That's the simple way for me to put it. If you think about like arteries, veins, your intestinal tract, all of those are round. They're either contracting or they're dilating. And so smooth muscle, they call it smooth because it looks a little bit different and functions a little bit differently than skeletal muscle. Um, cardiac muscle like branches off in order to send the electrical signal throughout the heart. It starts in like one point and it, and it goes throughout the tissue throughout the heart. So it also looks a little bit different um, than skeletal muscle. So we're mainly gonna focus on skeletal, but all of them have to contract in some form or fashion, where when your muscles, like if you feel your bicep, you got it stretched out and then you contract it, what happens? Is it getting bigger? No, what's it getting? It's getting closer together, that's right. So, I mean, it's the same as it was stretched out as it is together, it's just, the muscle fibers in there, or the, the, the uh, cells in there, the, the, excuse me, the, the proteins in there have moved past one another and they've just got closer to one another. It's just in a smaller space. So how does that actually take place? That is the fun part. Oh, and um, just FYI, we got a lab tomorrow. I went and got the crickets during, pup, or during Patriot games. They're in the back, hopefully they don't all die. Um, and then- Do we still need to get roly polies? If you've got them, you can bring them, but if not, don't worry about it. I got enough, uh, did you bring them? I didn't. Okay, no. well, I mean, if you got 10, you can bring them. Okay, no, I didn't have any. I was wondering if I had to go out and hunt for some. No worries, we'll deal with crickets. Crickets are, I mean, it's already kind of got cold, so it's harder to find them, any, and they're typically a little bit harder to find. So crickets will work, and um, you guys will just have to deal with crickets jumping around, to be honest with you, but I guess y'all figure it out. So, muscle contraction, how does this process work? Just, just wrap your head around this. If you look at the top of 1121, you've got two types of fibers. You've got actin and myosin. We talked about those a lot with the cytoskeleton, okay? The easy way to remember these is myosin is the bigger word, and they're thicker. Actin is the smaller world word, and they're thinner. That's the only way I can remember it is the number of letters, okay? So actin is the smaller fibers, the myosin are the bigger, thicker fibers, the ones that are purple there in the picture, okay? And basically what happens is, like if your fingers, like if you took them like this, everybody look at mine. If you took them, these are like the actin and myosin um, fibers. And basically what happens during muscle contraction is they grab a hold of one another and then they pull together. So that's how they get closer. So when you think about your muscle getting bigger as it pulls closer, that's all that's happening is those fibers are just pulling past one another. That's how a muscle contracts, and then that's how a muscle relaxes and stretches back out, okay? So, what actually causes the muscle to contract though? That's a good question, 1123. Number one, let's just go through the, what's gonna be easier here? Um, let's look at the book. I, I did the notes this morning and everybody looked confused. We'll see how confused you look after the book. Uh, number one, Ashlyn. So, your brain has sent a signal to a muscle somewhere in your body, anywhere there's movement, and it's tell it's telling it to move. So, we're at the end of the neuron that's a, that's next to the muscle. Here we go. Go. The acetylcholine released at synaptic terminal diffuses across synaptic cleft and binds to receptor proteins on the muscle fibers plasma membrane, triggering an action potential in the Okay, so the action potential made its way to the end of the neuron. The neurotransmitter made its way across the gap. We talked about that yesterday. I'm not going to go through all the steps. And it's attached to the opposite end of those um, on the muscle cell. So it's attached to the um, receptors on the side of the muscle cell. Number two, Mariah. The myosin and No, 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 no. Number two in the, in the book. 1123. We're not ready for that yet. Our brains will explode. Action potential is propagated along plasma membrane and down to T tubules. Okay, so the T tubule are these basically just like channels that go into and help that signal get into the muscle cell. Number three, Sarah. Action potential triggers CO2 plus release from SR. Okay, so in your notes it explains this. And we already talked about this. CA2 plus is what? Calcium. calcium ions, also referred to as calmodulin. 
and it's stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is basically the muscle cells. Sarcoplasmic reticulum. ER. It's the muscle cells ER, yeah. So this is where these calcium ions are stored. Calcium ions act as a what? Secondary messenger. Secondary messenger, thank you. So they're stored in there. They're hanging out. They're ready to send a signal. You guys need to contract, okay? So this requires, like I said yesterday, requires a lot of calcium in order for this to take place. So action potential is triggered. Calcium ions are released from the, the uh, ER and the muscle cells. Number four, uh, Mason? Calcium ions bind to tryptamine and then fill that myosin binding site is exposed. Okay, so if you look under number four there, you've got these little round things that look like bowling balls with one hole in them, or maybe even somebody said this morning, a pumpkin with the top off. Okay, y'all see those? Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are your actin filaments. Normally, they're covered up. You see that little rope-like thing? That's the troponin. Um, normally, those openings are covered up. So when calcium comes in, basically it causes that little rope-like thing that covers them up to move over. And when it does that, then number five, um, Katie? Okay, that couldn't be any more confusing. So basically what happens here is in that actin filament, that little um, rope-like thing slides over and then the myosin, the big purple thing at the bottom, where it has a little arm that almost like looks like it stretches up, it's gonna reach up and grab a hold of that opening on the actin. And when it grabs it, then it's gonna cause, it's gonna reach up, like I said with my fingers, it's gonna reach up, it's gonna grab it, and then it's gonna pull it closer. And that's how the contraction takes place. And then number seven, tropomyosin blockage of myosin binding sites is restored, contraction end, ends and muscle fiber releases. So basically that's all that's saying is, is it relaxes, it un unhooks, okay? So, and all of this right here takes a lot of ATP energy to work. So, I mean, we're sitting here not doing a whole lot. Most of our energy is going to processing and breaking down food and whatever's going on in our bodies right now. But if you're out running around playing football or soccer or tennis or band or whatever you people do in your spare time, like, and your muscles are constantly contracting, it takes a ton of energy because it takes ATP every time those jokers are grabbing a hold of one another, pulling past one another, then they're relaxing, it takes more ATP. So every time your muscles are contracting and, contracting and moving, the six or 700 muscles you've got in your body, um, it's taken a lot of energy in order to do that, okay? So, in part two, muscle relaxation. So like we said yesterday, in order for this to happen again, it's gotta reset. Number one, Miranda? In the notes? Yeah, in the notes. Hold on, what does that sound like? Membrane. You're a genius. Go. Destroys the acetylcholine molecule on the membrane. All right, number two. Five. The phosphorus is taken off the hands and actin slides back to its original position. Number three. Sarcoplasma reticulum reabsorbs calcium ions and then it's ready to contract again. Good. All right, how y'all feel about that? Now you know how your muscles contract. Da-na-na. You people at home, I hope y'all got that.